Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Pori Ranch stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! First one is titled, Fiancé cheated and dumped me because I put all of my money into Bitcoin back in 2013. So, I was hanging out with a friend when the subject arrived at my ex-fiancé. Then I realized this history was too juicy to not be shared. So, back in the day, I started buying Bitcoin. I wasn't a serious buyer, I just thought it was a neat thing. I had just proposed to my ex, and things were pretty good. I started learning more about the whole concept of a decentralized currency, how modern baking is destroying the economy and government-produced currencies have been melting through the years. It just made so much sense, so I started seriously buying more. At first, my ex didn't mind, she used to make condescending comments about me buying Monopoly money, and how stupid it sounded. Things started to go sour when I told her, all my savings were now in Bitcoin. She was livid, called me an immature irresponsible man-child. How dare I put our future together in jeopardy buying stupid things. I tried to explain to her many times the concepts behind it and how a currency that is deflationary by default had to increase its value. She didn't bought any of it, always with condescending comments about my cognitive abilities. I reminded her that it were my savings on the line, I would never demand or ask for her to invest in something she wasn't comfortable with. She argued that it didn't matter the money was mine, we were starting a future together and I had to consider our financial security before putting all my money in stupid things. We were never the same after that fight. After that, maybe a bit out of spite, I doubled down on Bitcoin. I sold my car and bought more. I was overweight and lost 25 pounds biking to work. We started to resent each other more day after day. About a year after the big fight, I discovered she was ducking a co-worker of hers, a shoulder to cry on became a dick to ride on. After a nasty fight, she took the ring off, threw it at me, saying, I hope when you're bankrupt and alone you finally realize how stupid you are. She started dating the co-worker not long after. Her family sided with her and all hate my guts. Those were tough times, the price kept going down, I doubted myself many times but I held on. Needless to say, my investment paid off. After the first surge, I sold some of it, made profit over my initial investment and kept some and then bought back when it hit 5k. I won't go into details about my finances, but let's just say I don't really have to worry about money anymore. My ex became just a distant memory after so much happened. Last week, I met an old friend that used to live abroad, he is a common friend of me and my ex. We had a good time catching up until the topic became my ex. Apparently, she married that co-worker, had a couple of kids and was living the life she thought impossible with me. Good for her, I thought. Well that was the case until her husband's business went under because of Covid and she found out about his affair with a 20-year-old sugar baby. Now they're amidst a nasty divorce procedure and financial trouble. I would be lying if I say I don't feel just a bit happy about her demise, it is the cherry on top of my whole story, it just makes it too juicy not to share. I'm thinking about sending her a Christmas card this year. Next one is titled, Whose cow is it anyway? Here's one of my father-in-law's stories, which I think you guys might like. He and his ex-wife had met in middle school during the 80s. At 15, she became pregnant with my wife. Her own parents were dead by then, her mother having been killed by her father, and he having overdosed a few years later, so they were dependent on FIL's very poor family for support. So my father-in-law drops out and begins working as a laborer at a plastics plant which won massive clusterfuck of safety violations. I worked there myself when I was younger, and of my two friends there, one had his arm smashed to a pulp and the other was killed. While Phil is working, Mill is home taking care of their daughter. She's living in a shack that had been a store 30 years prior, roughly the size of one bedroom. They were allowed to stay there by FIL's mother's church, which owned the building. At the same time, she's constantly being visited by FIL's mother, who absolutely hates her and treats her like crap. 
So Mill was pretty overwhelmed with this being her life. She became addicted to drugs, did a lot of shitty things, and after several years took off. When they were finally divorced, she never even showed up to the custody hearing. Now, her leaving was one thing, but what really sucked was him learning that a few loans which had been taken out to get them on their feet had all been spent on drugs. One of those loans had been for a new car. Why? Because on his drive home one night, a cow had walked out in front of his car, and he hit it. The car and the cow were both totaled. Normally the farmer who owned the cow would be responsible, except he decided that it wasn't his. He's the only one there with black cattle, and the wreck occurred right in front of his pasture, which had a downed fence. Somehow, his BS worked, and he wasn't held responsible, so Phil had to pay for a new car out of pocket. So after Mill left, Phil was in the hole for a lot of money, and is having trouble putting food on the table. He and his daughter move back in with his mother, and when he's not working he starts hunting and trapping to feed them. One day, he notices that Farmer Dickhead's cattle are out again. All of them. He runs over to his friend's house, they grab a rifle, hop in the friend's truck, and head back out there. Phil tells his friend to shoot one of the smaller ones. Friend takes aim, and shoots the largest. Phil turns to him, you idiot. How are we going to load that thing into the truck? Phil Field dresses the cow right there, next to the road, and the two finally manage to load it. They head home, and the family eats like kings. Next day, farmer dickheads all over town screaming about someone killing one of his cattle. Phil just laughs, if they're not his cattle when they're out of the fence, then I didn't kill his cow. Next one is titled, Lawyer Disbarred for Screwing Me. I've had a rough past two years, was living in British Columbia and got my girlfriend, now fiancé, pregnant and we had a beautiful little boy. Had to go back to the States, because I overstayed on my visa and was given trouble at the border when I tried to go back. My fiancé couldn't leave the baby and he was too small to travel, so we wait a few months and decide to get my permanent residency. Her cousin knew a lawyer and recommended her, thought this would be the solution. The nightmare begins. We forked over 6,000 and began the process, months of paperwork going back and forth and all the usual hoops you jump through. Coming to the end of it the lawyer forgets to get a few key papers, like sponsorship paperwork and minor other things. I thought okay, this isn't a big deal, we can get this all turned in and get back on track. The first red flag hit me when she started talking about the illegals and how if I crossed over that it wouldn't be a big deal and I could be with my family. I had to tell my lawyer that was not a good idea. Fast forward a month later and my paperwork finally clear the consulate in Seattle and is en route to my home. I get a phone call from my crying fiancé when it hadn't showed up when we expected and she called to find out why. She tells me the lawyer called the consulate and said that I wanted the address changed to my fiancé in BC and to send it there. I immediately call her and said I didn't approve of this and that she lied to the consulate who we promptly informed. She then proceeds to tell me that I need to illegally sneak across the border and get it from my fiancé and that everything will be fine since my packet has my PR card and number. I was speechless and explained to her my issues. 1. This is illegal. 2. What about all the stuff I have to move? 3. Why did you do something without my consent that wasn't necessary? 4. Won't this get me in trouble? She honestly had no good points and Donkey punched herself in the taint with her words. Fiancé and I had contacted the firm after and told them everything. Apparently she got three people banned from Canada by doing what she tried to with us and was on probation of sorts with the firm. Later that day we got a call from them informing us that she had been fired and they would be following up to get her disbarred. We explained everything to the consulate as well. Judging by the actions the firm made in compensating our whole case tells me something must have been said in conversation with the consulate. So we got my permanent residency for free, got our lawyer fired and later disbarred from law practice and our family is happily together. Currently planning the wedding. I also found out later she actually went to jail for negligence and some other charges. I didn't let the lawyer cheat me and she hung herself, I just gave her the rope. Oh, I should mention that the cases she worked where the three people got banned were overturned due to her incompetence. 
For those asking, Trudeau has changed laws making it possible to mail PR cards outside of Canada. Last one is titled, Scumbag Aunt Ripped Off My Grandma For Years, I Put My Nose In Her Business And Had The IRS Financially Ruin Her. This happened about five years ago. My grandma was getting old, late 80s, early 90s. She had one wish, to not die in a senior home. Easily done as my grandpa sold some assets way back when, then invested the money and let it ride for 30 plus years, he never touched it and collected a pension. Way back when my grandpa died, about 10 years before this, my grandma appointed my dad, this shitty aunt and my uncle as the trustees of the trust. Basically the trusted advisors for her and her care for the foreseeable future. All was well in the beginning, then my dad, Willie, moved further away and couldn't take care of the day-to-day -day upkeep as the trustee and to see that my grandma was okay. My aunt, Rebecca, told her that she and my uncle, Fred, who lived in Arizona, could take over and all would be fine. It was fine for a while. A few times my dad went back to visit and noticed my grandma didn't always have overnight care or that her mail wasn't picked up and the driveway wasn't plowed. She also lost her cable TV and newspaper subscription. My dad figured it just lapsed so he had the services put back on. My dad also noticed my grandma was eating moldy food at times because her truck was sold and she had no transportation, she drove up to 90 years old. She basically just chilled at the house alone and did crossword puzzles. The craziest part of this is that my aunt only lived two miles from my grandma, but my grandma told my dad she saw Aunt Rebecca once a week on Saturday for about one hour. As with the elderly in age, my grandma passed away. She did get her wish and was able to die in her own home. Upon her death things started to get real interesting. Once the probate lawyer got her children, my dad, aunt, uncle and another estranged aunt, Becky. Around the table some shady business started to come out. My aunt Rebecca asked that everyone just forego any audit or paperwork and they just sell the house, for around $400,000 and divide up the remaining back account balance of roughly $400,000. So just signing on the line, each sibling was to get a check for $200,000, not too bad of an inheritance. My dad thought that was somewhat a little rushed. He said at the time that he wanted to wait because my grandma's house was easily in the $600,000 range based on size and location. My aunt exploded in his face cursing at him and calling him all kinds of names because he was unwilling to sign the assets then and there. She basically wanted a quick close while everyone looked the other way. My dad ended up leaving the room after the screaming and the deal wasn't signed that day. It took nearly six months before another appointment and they were all back at the table. The thing is though, when you are a trustee and the person dies, the funds and access to financial accounts are all under heavy scrutiny until all beneficiaries are made aware and sign the final papers. At the next meeting, my dad went in there with no intention to sign the deal. He got his brother, my uncle Fred, to agree that they audit the entire accounts going back five years. When they demanded this again at the meeting with the lawyer, my aunt ended up arguing that a forensic audit would cost $5,000 and it's a waste, like what difference does it make? Two beneficiaries requested it, so it was what was going to happen. The audit report showed up about three months later. Here is where it gets good. My dad began looking over the audit report saw it was full of holes, like excessive monthly food costs for a 90-year-old lady. Payments made for car services for a car my grandma no longer had. Many different things in there they just didn't add up. My dad asked me to give the audit a second look, so I spent a Saturday night going over it, and here is some crazy stuff I found, and alerted my dad about, 1. Costco monthly food costs of $1,100 to $2,000 for the last 4 years. 2. Telephone bills for 6 cell phones, grandma has a home phone only. 3. Gasoline for a truck my grandma didn't have for like 4 years, and easily $400 per month. 4. House repairs paid to my aunt's husband who owned a construction business, some of the house repairs were like $16,000 for a new roof, new garage doors, home security system which she didn't have, etc., all inflated prices. 
5. Grandma paid for my aunt to go to Europe twice on vacation. 6. My grandma was paying my estranged aunt Becky a stipend of $2,000 a month for the last five years, as well as her deadbeat son for $2,500. Every month they were paid. 7. All grandkids were to be paid a lump sum of $10,000 upon their 30th birthday as that is when the $50 check from grandma stopped for all grandkids. Guess who was paid out? Her kids and my estranged aunt's kids, but not me or my siblings. 8. My grandma gave loans to my aunt Rebecca for her husband's construction business in return for equity in the company, which amounted to nothing. These loans totaled about $200,000 over three years, right around when the housing bust happened. Dot. They also sold her assets like jewelry and whatnot for cash, because some big ticket items simply vanished from her house. Armed with all this, the next probate meeting was interesting. In the time between my grandma's death and the third probate meeting, my aunt's construction business filed for bankruptcy so that $200,000 in equity grandma had, simply vanished. The probate lawyer was also somewhat concerned and makes it obvious that this was fraud and breach of fiduciary duty, where my aunt could actually get real prison time. After this, the negotiations were much more favorable. My aunt got nothing, literally zero. My other aunt only received $25,000 after all the stipend payments. My father and uncle shared the rest, after all grandkids received the $10,000 payout. The house sold to the first offer for $520,000. That was the regular revenge for any treacherous witch that ripped off grandma and had her eating moldy food. Here is the pro. My aunt probably felt pretty bad that she couldn't supplement her lifestyle with grandma's money anymore. But that was the least of her worries. Since she tried to personally rip me off for $10,000, I took it personally. I don't care how tough you are, the IRS is the scariest thing that can happen to a person, nobody wants to have their money forcibly removed. I did a little research and found the 3949A I also had the audit and legal office could, would provide the full trust in requested, demanded by the IRS, I don't know if it ever was. So I photocopied my documents, had then notarized and sent off the info to the IRS. I felt like it went nowhere, then maybe 18 months later I was notified and asked to come to the IRS building for an appointment in my city. The agent went over all the details, what they found in their research and then they asked for a sworn statement. It turns out my aunt didn't declare something like $1.2 million in additional income over five years and as such she owed the IRS around $420,000 plus penalties. There was no way she was going to pay that on a teacher's pension and after her husband's bankrupt his business. Her house was sold, her vehicle sold, and they left the state. Now aunt and uncle live in a depressing desert town like in the southwest. The IRS paid me around $60,000 about three months after the appointment. She should have paid that $10,000. Thanks for listening.